In this tutorial, we'll cover the render setup in V-Ray for 3ds Max. So let's go ahead and start by making a box. And I'll add a plane as the ground plane for that. Um, and we're not going to deal with materials yet, so we're just going to do the render setup. So to set up the rendering, um, you just go to rendering, render setup. And depending on the production renderer you're going to use, you want to change the renderer here. Uh, you want to make sure production renderer mode is set up. That way you're doing a final rendering. And you want to change this to whatever render engine you're using. So I'm going to use my V-Ray 5 Hotfix 2. Um, this would be whatever V-Ray version you have for 3ds Max. Um, if your license is set up, then you should see all these settings. If it's not, you'll see a thing that says cannot obtain license, in which case you have to figure out what's going on with your license. But um, mine seems to be working here. So now that we have our menu, um, first thing we can change is render common parameters. And so right now we're doing a single rendering. If we were rendering an animation, we would change this to either the entire active segment, or you can actually pick a range of frames or a very specific frame. So right now we'll just keep it at single. Um, right now we're just gonna render the whole view. But if you're rendering a very complex scene, it's really useful to uh, do this crop command. So you can just test a little corner of the render without wasting time rendering the entire rendering. Um, when you're done with that, you can hit that checkbox and then go back to view. Um, next thing is the output size. So this is the size of the rendering you're going to do. If you go to rendering from the drop down, print size assistant, this will help you choose the pixel width and height depending on the page that you want to physically print the rendering on. So if I'm doing a landscape at let's say 11 inch by 17, so a, tablet, uh, a tabloid size, you can see it automatically changes the dimensions, the width and the height to match that page size. So it's going to print at 200 dpi, which is perfectly acceptable. You can then hit render setup again and you go back to this and you'll see that the width and height under output size is automatically changed. Now sometimes you want to render um, you know a smaller version so you can always choose custom. There are also all these presets here so it just depends on what you want to do. I'm going to render a smaller one here just for speed sake and we'll just do 1200. Actually I'll just pick um, 800 by 600 over here and one thing you could do is this image aspect ratio if you want you can lock this and I could you know increase the size and if I click in the height box it'll automatically update both the width and the height so that they're the same aspect ratio so it's really nice to like bring this down for a test rendering and then increase it back up for our, um, the final rendering um, down here you can turn off things like displacement if your rendering is taking too long. If um, you import a, a model from a different program, sometimes the normals get flipped. So if you force two-sided, that will render on both the front and back face of an object. Um, further down, if you want to render and save the file when it's finished rendering, you can just click here, Files, and then choose where you want to send save this file. Um, I'd usually save as a TIFF format and make sure, so if, for example, I just save this as a test. Um, is a TIFF format, uh, and then hit save. You want to make sure when this pop-up shows up that you select store alpha channel. That'll allow you to delete the background of the rendering. So if you want to replace the sky, for example, or background, you can easily do that in Photoshop if you store the alpha channel. It just makes that a little easier. So I'll just say OK there. Now we'll automatically save when I render. You can turn that on or off. You could also save it once it renders. You don't have to do this. Um, you can hit a little button after it renders. Um, next thing down here is V-Ray. These are the settings. Now there's a lot of different settings you can do. Um, you can even change this to advanced or expert to, to reveal even more settings. For this basic tutorial, I'm just going to show you the default and the basic um, setup. And we're just going to leave everything as it is. The one thing I would change is progressive here under image sampler to bucket. Um, progressive is nice, but if you don't render the right um, settings, then it can actually look kind of blurry. Um, so I just recommend doing bucket and you'll get a little better results on these defaults if you change it to bucket. Um, you can leave all this as default. Uh, there's a few image filters. These are just different ways of, of, of aliasing the image. So um, you can play around with these. I tend to use area or Catmull ROM if I have a lot of details. But, you know, for the sake of this, um, you can just try different ones and see what fits your image. Um, next thing down is the environment. So this will turn on your global illumination environment. I tend to do this if, if you're using like HDRI lighting, um, which we'll talk about later, you'll have to put in your V-Ray HDRI map as the environment and the reflection refraction. For now, we'll just use a color. So I'll just turn on my GI environment, 
GI reflection refraction environment. And I'll just drag with my left mouse button that color down to this color and just copy that. So that way the reflections are a slight blue as opposed to a black color. And you can, you can change those colors if you want, use maps and so forth. But now I just want to have them turned on. If I increase this number to two, it's going to double the environment illumination. One is sort of the default, so we'll just keep it at that. But if you want to really crank up the global illumination, you can just double that number, for example. The next thing is color mapping. Um, again, like the filters, this really depends on your preference. I tend to use HSV exponential. If you hover over these, by the way, it will give you a little um, information about them. So if I hover over that, it'll tell you uh, what each of them does. I like HSV because it keeps the saturation pretty rich. It's not as realistic, so just keep that in mind. And, and really, depending on the interior, if you're doing an interior or an exterior, you might want to change these. So it's worth looking up what these uh, different color mappings do. Um, okay, next, we're going to leave the camera. Um, under GI, we have the global illumination. We're going to enable this. Um, this is your primary and secondary bounces. So as light bounces around your scene, uh, it carries light information with it. So uh, you have to imagine light as a series of balls or photons that are bouncing around your scene. Um, there's, there'll be a direct light um, photon that'll hit a surface. It'll bounce and it'll bounce again. And every time it bounces, it carries information like the color um, of the of the material that it's reflecting off of, the um, how much uh, intensity is lost as it bounces. So all of that is determined by these bounces. So in general, um, a lot of people use brute force. I'm going to use a radiance map for my primary engine and light cache for my secondary. I found that to be a really good balance of both speed and quality. But again, it's something you can test. Um, I like the irradiance because you can change the preset on the fly. So I'll start usually with a low if I'm just rendering test renderings. And then when I get back to the final, I'll use high. If you're doing an animation, I highly recommend using the irradiance map and then using one of these presets, uh, medium or high an animation. It just makes it a little bit smoother. You get less flickering. So I recommend using those. For now, I'll just keep it on medium. Um, then, and then later when you get into animation, you can change some of these. But we're just doing single frame now. Um, under light cache, I like to increase this number of subdivisions to 2500. Just adds a little more resolution. If you hover over any of these, by the way, it gives you a little readout of what it does and the different settings and, and what they mean. Um, I tend to like this 2500. I think it just produces a slightly better, better result and doesn't take any more time. So not really. So um, that's a good setting. Um, next is caustics. We're not going to change that. Or we're not going to turn that on. It takes a really long time to render caustics. But that's that high, uh, high illumination that comes through glass bottles or plastic. It's that like very sharp um, light, and that's called a caustic. So it can take a long time to render, but it looks really nice if you're doing like a still life or small object rendering. Next is settings. Um, we'll just keep all of these the same. And then render elements, we'll talk about these later, but um, every time you render a render, the final render is called the beauty pass, or the final render. And it's basically a combination of all these different layers that are then combined automatically to produce that final rendering. Sometimes it's nice to actually break some of those out. Like I tend to use the V-Ray material ID layer, which allows me to then in Photoshop break up each object into um, individual layers. So I, if I wanna change the color of the wall, I could change just that material in Photoshop without affecting anything else. So that, that, that's helpful for that. I'll do another video on that later. But you know, some people like to pull out reflection if they wanna increase or decrease that in Photoshop and have it as a separate layer. So this can be really nice render elements. For now, we'll just keep that off. So that's the basic render setup. If I just hit render, um, I'll get a very quick rendering. Not, you know, nothing's really happening. I don't have light or material, but that's the basic setup. If you want to save your render, you just hit this little button here, and then you can save that render. You can see mine automatically saved because I saved it um, uh, when I set up the setup. But um, if you didn't, you can just put that in there now and then um, change it to a TIFF or PNG or Targo, whatever file type you want.